Acts 23, I want to begin in verse number 11. Uh, this is the account where Paul has uh, been before the Sanhedrin to give his defense. He, uh, he opens up his mouth, verse 1 in this chapter, and uh, immediately the high priest doesn't like what he hears and has Paul slapped across the face. Um, he opens his mouth and he gets in trouble. And if you remember correctly, as he begins the dialogue with them, he... Um, he uh, re recognizes that there are part Sadducees and part Pharisees there, and he says, because of the resurrection, I'm called into question this day, and divides the crowd, and to the point that the Roman soldiers uh, thought that Paul was going to be torn in two. I mean, they were literally pulling him uh, back and forth. That's what verse 10 tells us. And so they take Paul back into custody. They're still trying to, the Romans are still trying to understand what it is, what's the charge exactly against this man. But God has given him favor with the Roman soldier, uh, and um, he's trying to see that he gets a fair trial, that he is properly heard, and they really get, get down to the bottom of the matter. And after this, uh, again, this event where the Jews, um, you know, try to attack him and, and seek his physical harm, they want him dead. In verse 11, it says, And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. So God makes a promise to Paul, right? Paul, you're here in Jerusalem. It's a mess, right? <laughs> they, they want you dead. And, and, and they've tried multiple times to kill you. But I'm promising you, you are going to be a witness to me in Rome. Jerusalem is not where your life is going to end. You're making it all the way to Rome to be a witness of Jesus Christ. Immediately on the heels of that, look at what Paul finds out the next day. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And, there were, and they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now therefore ye with the council... Uh, signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto, to you tomorrow as though you would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. So you guys act like you want to hear him again. You, you're ready to give him audience again. And, uh, and, and when they bring him to you on the way, we're going to, we 40 guys, we're going to make sure he never makes it, right? We're going to take him out. So 40 men set on killing Paul. He's got the Jewish leaders, um, in, in, uh, they're in agreement with this, they're in league with these men concerning this. Uh, humanly speaking, it looks like Paul is a dead duck, right? But God made a promise to Paul, didn't he? And Paul, you're going to make it to Rome. And so, lo and behold, uh, they make this plan, they have this plot, but they don't know that Paul's sister's son is listening. It says that when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle. Thanks, buddy. Entered into the castle and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee, who hath something to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, What is that thou hast to tell me? And then he said, The Jews have agreed to, des to desire thee that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council, as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them, for there lie in wait for, uh, for him of them more than forty men, which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for a promise from thee. So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen threescore and ten, and spearmen two hundred at the third hour of the night, about four hundred and seventy men. And provide them beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. And so sure enough, Paul does make it safely to Caesarea to Felix, the governor. 
I'm sure we've all heard the joke about the man. It's funny because I thought I will never remember the details of this joke. And I punch it in Google and I said, joke, man. And the first thing that came up was joke, man, on the roof or something like that. It was the first one I was looking for. I couldn't believe it. It's like that's the most common joke with a man that's searched for on Google. But it's the idea where this man, there's a flood coming. Someone comes and warns him and he says, no thanks, I don't need to leave, God's going to save me, right? Somebody comes on in the car before the flood hits, says, let's get out of here, a flood's coming, God's going to save me. You know, there's a canoe, there's a boat, there's finally a helicopter, the man dies in the flood, right? And so the, the way the story goes is he says, God, why didn't you save me? I was trusting in you. He's like, well, I sent you a warning, I sent you a boat, I sent you a helicopter, right? What else did you want? He was looking for some miraculous deliverance when God was just going to save him through ordinary means, right? Through ordinary human means. I think that sometimes we mistakenly think that we are not trusting in God when we have a promise for God, from God and we have any part in it. God makes us a promise and well that means I need to just sit down and let God work. And what stood out to me in this passage is that the Apostle Paul did not do that. What did God just promise to him? You're going where? Rome. To Rome. And so right after that, he finds out, these guys are going to kill me. There's a plot against me. Forty men that have bound themselves together. We're not going to eat or drink until Paul is dead. And so when the young man, his nephew, comes to Paul and tells him this, Paul does not say... And there are a lot of people that would criticize him for not saying this. Paul does not say, you know what? God has promised that I'll make it to Rome, so don't trouble yourself, right? Don't worry about it. God's going to take care of me. I'm going to Rome. For some people, anything less would have been a lack of faith on Paul's part, right? What, what a terrible witness to this young man that Paul didn't say that, right? But what does Paul do? He does what anybody logically would do, right? Human reasoning says there's a plot to kill me, so contact the police, right? Let the police know, and that's what Paul does. He says, go tell the police. Go tell the Roman soldier that's in charge of me of the plot that you have. There was nothing wrong with that. Paul was not condemned for that. God did not say, Paul, I'm taking you to Rome, and so now I want you to throw out all logic and reason on the way there, right? He did what made sense in that hour. And man, what <laughs> it was a miraculous experience because Paul is now going to be escorted by 470 Roman soldiers. I don't know of any heads of state today that are accompanied by 470 men to make I don't think the police, I mean the uh, president's motorcade is anything like that. I actually looked it up and tried to figure it out and best I could tell there were around 50 or 60 men that guard the president as he goes from place to place. Paul had nearly 500 to make sure that he was safe on this first leg of his trip to Rome. God used ordinary human means to accomplish his purpose. And you know what? God does that all the time. And we don't ever need to forget that. On the flip side of that, you know, in understanding we don't need to throw out logic and reason as we head towards that promise that God has made, we also need to understand that, that when those human means work, when you go to the doctor and you get better, right? When you take the medicine and you feel better, it wasn't the doctor or the medicine that made you better, right? It was God using those means to take care of His own. And that's what God does all the time. God said He would go to Rome. Paul trusted that God would get him to Rome. But Paul did not throw away just simple common sense on the way there. I think about that with these people that say, I'm not going to the doctor because God's going to heal me. If God spoke to you, if God sent His angel to you and said, don't go to the doctor because I'm going to heal you, okay, right? But other than that, go to the doctor, right? Because God uses those ordinary means to take care of His children. Just because God makes a promise does not mean that there will not be Tremendous human effort in the fulfillment of that promise. And I want to show you some examples of that. 
Just because God makes a promise does not mean that there will not be tremendous human effort in the fulfillment of that promise. It was a big undertaking to gather together 470 men to accompany Paul at 9 o'clock at night on his trip to Felix. But that was the means that the Lord had provided to get Paul safely along his fir the first leg of his trip to Rome. I want to make this point. Resting in God's promises rarely equates to inactivity. Faith with inactivity is dead, right? Resting in God's promises rarely equates to inactivity. There may be times that God says, don't do a thing, and I'm not speaking against that. But often God says, I want you to trust in me, and I've got something for you to do in the meantime. All right? And so we want to see that in the Word of God. So with the promise of God, we continue in the reasonable things, but all the while we trust in God to fulfill His words so that when it seems everything is working against that promise, which is exactly what happened to Paul, right? Immediately after getting this promise, what does he find out? Forty men are going to kill me. We trust in God all the while so that when everything seems to be working against that promise, we don't despair, but we press on. Look at Genesis chapter number 6. Genesis chapter number 6. As far as the promise of God, there being tremendous human effort involved in the fulfillment of the promise of God. Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis 6, in verse number 17, God states He is destroying every human being except for Noah and his children. And listen to the promise that God makes in Genesis 6, 17. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in dearth, earth shall die. Not just human beings, right? Every living creature except for those that Noah's going to take on the ark. But with thee, Noah, will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. I promise to keep you guys safe, right? I promise to spare your life when everything else is going to be destroyed. You and your wife and your sons and their wives. Now, God determined back in verse number 3 that He was going to destroy everybody. And we find out then that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 3 says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. hundred and twenty years from now, I'm destroying the world. I'm destroying the earth, every living thing, with a flood, except for Noah and his family. Now, I have made the mistake before of saying that this is when God told Noah about this, and so it was 120 years from the time Noah found out about it, it took him that long to build the ark. That's actually not true. And the reason we know that is because if you go to chapter 5 and verse number 32, it says, And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah was 500 when he started having children, and uh, it tells us in God's Word that he was 600 when the flood started, so he didn't have his first kid until 100 years before the flood. And all three of those kids had to get grown and get married by the time God said, you're going to build the ark. So it was actually probably more like 75 years, something like that. If they, we know that Shem and, Ham, um, Shem and Japheth were, were born two years apart from one another, and I can show you that if you want to see it. But if, they had, if he had each of those boys a couple of years apart, and then they got to marriage age, it would have been at least 75 years probably um, from the time that it took to build the ark. But the point is this. There was tremendous human effort in the fulfillment of God's promise that you're going to be kept safe in the ark. Right? And Noah had a responsibility in the promise that God has made. And children, we have responsibility in the promises that God has made to us. That's, that's really my whole point. I'm just really retelling you what Brother Tommy's already told you. We have a responsibility to apprehend that for which we are apprehended. Thank you, Brother Tommy. There is an active apprehension in that which we have been apprehended, right? And so 
it's a long time is going to transpire between when God told Noah that the flood is coming and the time that it actually comes to pass. So what if Noah had ad, had the attitude, hey guys, we're safe, right? Let's eat and drink, let's buy and sell, and we'll just go on about our lives. And hey, when the flood comes, God is going to miraculously sustain us. An ark is just going to appear. <laughs> That's not his attitude at all. Right? 75 years of hard labor. 75 years of preaching the word of God. He was a preacher of righteousness, the scripture tells us. Tremendous human effort in those 75 years so that Noah and his family would be safe. This promise from God did not promote inactivity. It was actually just the opposite, right? It prompted Noah to action. And that's what the promises of God ought to do to us, right? Because now Noah's not building a boat thinking this is going to be a failed effort when I'm all said and done. Noah's building a boat thinking God is going to bless this effort. And this is going to work to the salvation of me and my family. And the promises of God are like that for us, children. The fact that God is sovereign ought to give us hope as we preach the Word of God. Because you know what? Every single elect child of God is going to be saved. Amen. It is going to be effectual in the hearts of God's people. It cannot be unprofitable. Your labor in the Lord is what? Not in vain, right? And so it doesn't prompt inactivity, just the opposite. Our faith and trust in the promise of God, because God's the one that made it, our faith and trust in God prompts us to activity, not inactivity. Activity guided by the Spirit of God. Noah wasn't just doing anything, right? What was he doing? Well, let's read on. In verse number, um, verse number 14 and 15, it says, make, God says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, and the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. I, God gives him exact dimensions for the boat. Uh, the boat is going to be the late 1800s before anybody makes an ocean-going vessel this large. So tremendous effort at this time in human history. And God doesn't stop there. That's not all that you have to do, Noah. Look, listen to what else he had to do in verse number 19. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind of every uh, creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive and take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten and thou shalt gather it to thee and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Noah's got to make sure that there are pens built for all of these animals that he's going to bring in. He's going to have to guide those animals to each one. He's going to take, have to take into account the fact that these animals are going to eat and you know what? It's going to go somewhere, so I've got to do something with that, right? He's got to make sure there's enough food to sustain these animals and sustain his family. And he's going to be stuck on this boat for a year. Tremendous effort, right? He's not sitting down taking it easy, man. They were working hard for however long it took them to build that ark. And verse 22 is the key to that activity that was involved those however many 75 years or whatever it was. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So did he. His faith prompted him to act. His faith prompted him to behave in line with the commandment of God, to walk in obedience to God. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We have one verse about Noah in this list of these saints that exercised faith in accomplishing these amazing things. And it says in verse number 7 of Hebrews 11, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Faith said, you got something to do, Noah. Faith said, you got to build this boat, or guess what? If you don't obey God in this, you and your family are not going to enjoy the promise of God. 
I got a verse that just says that point blank in the New Testament. And Lord willing, we'll see that in a minute. Faith prompted him to act. And his acts resulted in the saving of his house. And who gets the glory for that? God, the object of that faith. Amen? God was working through normal human means. No, I'm going to give you year after year after year, but you're going to have to be steady, right? You're going to have to stand strong. That's year after year after year enduring, enduring, enduring the mocking and the ridicule of those around you. Never even seen rain fall from the sky. I believe he probably built this boat nowhere near a body of water. <laughs> what a fool he was in the eyes of men, right? And yet tirelessly, year after year, keep on. There's not any time to sit down, put on the whole armor of God, right? There's not any time to check out of the fight. And labor in that which God has commanded. Be obedient to God as you wait expectantly for God to fulfill His promise. That's what Noah did, and he and his house were saved, and the rest of the world were condemned. You say, well, Noah was given specific instruction, right? That's not really what we were talking about with Paul. Paul doesn't have any specific instruction. He just does what makes sense, and he says, hey, nephew, go tell the police about this plot against me, right? Again, God using normal human means. Don't throw... Common sense out the window, right? You do what makes sense. And if it's not contrary to the Word of God, God's still going to fulfill His promise because He works through normal human means. David, to me, is a good example of a promise from God, but there was no specific action given, right? What did David know was going to happen? You're going to be king, right? But man, what a journey on the way to the throne, right? He was told that before he faced Goliath. He was told that before he played the harp for Saul. He was told that before Saul started hating him and trying to kill him. I mean, he's on the run from Saul. He, has, he goes to the priest and he eats the showbread. God didn't tell him to do that. You know why David did that? Because they were starving. Right? It just made sense. We're hungry. We're going to die. Whatever you got here, give us to eat. The priest said, all we've got is the holy bread. Right? Right? Have you guys kept yourself, you know, at least make sure the men are, are, have been kept themselves separate from women. You can read it. David said, we have, we're going to eat it. We're starving. And Jesus uses that very example for the Pharisees whenever they would do that which makes no sense and hold men bound by that. God said, David did what made sense and God didn't fault him for it. All of these things that David did on his way to the throne... He pretends to be a madman before the Philistine king. And then you go a little further and he's joined himself to the Philistine king, right? And yet all the while he's actually fighting against the Philistines and protecting the cities of Judah. Amazing story, but he had this promise of God that God was going to fulfill and God did it while David just went along doing the best that he could, walking in those things that made sense, walking in obedience to God. I told you I wanted to, I got some other things that I want to share, but we're running short on time. I told you I wanted to read you a verse, and that's in Hebrews. Well, you know what? Let's read Romans 12 first. Brother Gary Johnson sent this out in one of his devotionals the other day, and I was like, that's a good, I'm going to hold on to that. That's a good point. You know, I, I've used this word reason and logic. And why should we offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God? Look at Romans chapter 12. And verse number 1. Romans 12 and verse number 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your what kind of service? Reasonable service. That is, uh, I'm going to try the Greek word, and hopefully Nico's not listening and Brother Mike Conrad's not listening, but it's like, look. Logikos, or something like that. Uh, Wilma's listening. Don't listen, Sister Wilma. But it's where we get our word logical from. That's what it means. It's where we get that idea of logic from. In other words, that's just your logical service. Because of what God has done for you, it just makes sense. Because He sacrificed Himself for you that you would offer yourself as a living sacrifice unto Him. That's just reasonable, right? 
Logic isn't out the door in this. We're doing that which logically makes sense. And we're offering ourselves as living sacrifices to God because of all that He has done for us. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Here's that verse that I told you I wanted to share with you. Regarding the promise of God. That the promises of God do, do not mean, well, that... It does not mean inactivity. It means living by faith, which is always an active experience. Unless I said what God said to do is do nothing, right? And we're going to see an example of that as we go further in this study. Cast not away therefore your confidence, verse 35 says, which hath great recompense of reward. There is a reward that you expect as you are confident in the things that God has promised. For you have need of patience that after you have what? Done, Done the will of God. Is that active or inactive? That's a term of activity, right? After you have done the will of God, what is the result? You might receive the promise, right? So the promises of God don't prompt inactivity, but they actually embolden us so that in our activity we are confident that as we walk in accordance with the will of God, as we walk in obedience to Him, that God is fulfilling his promise. Doesn't matter what stands against us. Doesn't matter if he said you're making it to Rome and 40 men are about to kill me. God is going to keep his promise. Any thoughts as we close? Yeah, I'm scared to say something more too. <laughs> Lord, uh, Brother Gary. I was thinking as you were uh, teaching this and giving us the example of Paul. And there's lots of songs that are made up about this and stuff. But you know what? Ordinary events are quite miraculous. How come his nephew overheard the plot? Right. You see? Right. And uh, so live your life, do with that which is reasonable, and trust in the one who's the sovereign over all of that. Amen. Amen. It's not living your life apart from trust. Paul's confidence the whole time, even when he said, go tell the police, is that God's going to be the one that gets me to Rome. But it just makes sense to go tell the police that they're trying to kill me. Amen? I thought about what you said, ordinary human means, and the nephew just happened to be there. That was miraculous. I think about the king in Esther. Couldn't sleep. Right? When Mordecai's death has been determined by Haman. And lo and behold, what do they bring out? What book do they bring out? They're talking about the things that have been done in the kingdom. And it, they read the very area where Mordecai saved the life of the king. The Lord is able. Amen.